Good afternoon. Welcome to this Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing at UC Davis Nurse Practitioner Residency Webinar. I'm Rebecca Badeau. I am the Communications Director here for the School of Nursing. And this afternoon, I'll be serving as your MC of sorts as we get to learn more about the NP Residency Program. For the next half hour or hour or so, we hope to highlight a bit more about our residency program, why new NP graduates should apply for the program, and what makes the UC Davis Health Residency Program unique. You will hear from program leadership, a preceptor, and two alumni of the program, so they can really give you the nuts and bolts of what it's like going through this 12-month experience. If at any time you have a question, please put it in the Q&A. We are leaving time at the end of uh, our discussion for questions, but sometimes um, I see your questions and they're um, kind of in sync with what we're talking about at the time. So I may ask questions at any time. So feel free to put those in there. Um, if we don't get to all the questions, we will follow up with you via email. Um, and also we're recording this webinar. So you can um, go back and watch it. We'll send you a link to it uh, when we follow up with an email tomorrow. Uh, if you didn't hear something correctly, you wanted to hear something again, or if you have a colleague who couldn't join us today but was interested in the information that we're going to discuss, you can share that with them as well. So I think that's kind of the who's who's and what we're doing. Um, but I want to introduce you to the Associate Director of the Nurse Practitioner Residency, Dr. Laura Van Ocker. And um, for the sake of this webinar, once I introduce you, I'm going to go first names, Laura. We'll keep it. We'll keep it informal. We'll keep it casual. Um, so, so welcome and and tell the group a little bit about you. Yeah. So I'm um, a family nurse practitioner and have been for 40 years uh, in California with a specialty in rural health and underserved populations. I've been with the UC Davis Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing uh, for the last seven years as full-time faculty, working predominantly with the nurse practitioner, physician assistant, and MEPIN programs, and more recently as associate director for the nurse practitioner residency program, which we're going to be talking about here, the HRSA-sponsored program. Um, so I love teaching. Um, I've actually uh, been involved with that for all 40 years uh, as a preceptor and now full-time um, as assistant clinical professor. Thank you. Now, we have a very long uh, a, a word, the NP Practice Residency Program. Um, it's a clever acronym, I'll give you that, but th it's also loaded with a lot of the nuts and bolts um, of really what this residency program is about. Can you kind of walk us through what we're doing in, you know, in uh, telehealth and chronic condition um, and other aspects of the program? Right. So the, the acronym that we used was actually very purposefully uh, chosen. Um, this is a HRSA grant, which is a health services, um, you know, resource agency. And it focuses on workforce specifically for needs of underserved and rural populations with special needs. Those are populations that have exactly the kinds of things we're focused on, which is primary care uh, in areas where uh, special training uh, around addiction and recovery, chronic health, chronic health care needs for the underserved and high risk uh, clients, telehealth, which is a resource to increase access, and then also improvement science, the ability to look at what are we doing well and what do we need to do better with underserved high risk uh, populations. And then we also focus on collaboration and equity because we know that makes a huge difference in access to healthcare and healthcare outcomes for individuals, but also populations. So the acronym was very purposefully uh, selected and uh, matches the mission and vision of not only our school, but also the HRSA grant. Well, and I'll jump off that equity piece, that E, um, obviously equitable, equitable healthcare in underserved populations is one of the goals of the program. What are yeah. some of the large um, additional goals of this residency program? 
Well, the goals are we recognize that our nurse practitioners right now are um, qualified to practice as of the time of taking their national boards. Um, that doesn't mean that they actually have all the skills that it takes for high risk populations. And I think we have a slide on goals next too. Um, so basically, uh, we know that in high risk populations, um, increasing confidence and increasing skills of new graduates goes a long ways to improving healthcare. And so we focus on accelerating skills, accelerating confidence and um, mentoring to actually bring and match new grads up to the complexity of cases that we see in high-risk populations. And then of course, the goal is to expand competent healthcare uh, clinicians into the populations where they can really experience improvement to access to care and the quality of care that they receive to improve health outcomes. So we increase skills, uh, we accelerate skills, we accelerate confidence in a mentoring environment. So how do residents receive those, those clinical, educational, and teaching opportunities while they're in the program? Well, um, it's a 12-month program uh, with a focus on primary care. And so we, we look at matching up um, to the kinds of clinics. And I think our next slide actually goes into this well, too. Um, it allows us to take a look at the kinds of things that are um, structured in a way that we know new grads will learn best. And some of the things we focus on in the first quarter, which is your first, uh, first through four month, is really placing you within the federally qualified healthcare center um, or at UC Davis Health Clinics, which again, serve um, complex patients and clients. We also provide asynchronous educational modules. And as an experienced clinician, having worked in these uh, clinics for years myself, um, I'm able to actually curate the type of um, evidence-based practice that expands new grad learning. And we provide that in asynchronous educational models. For example, we may um, increase your knowledge uh, through module independent practices in hepatitis uh, B, in hepatitis C, in um, uh, increased compliance um, in um, HIV and chronic medications. And then we also, every two weeks or biweekly within a month, have half-day virtual Zoom sessions where we actually bring in guest speaker specialists, for example, to increase your skills in reading common um, x-rays, um, ultrasounds, how to interpret the types of uh, readings that come out of radiology. How do you best manage nutritional challenges within a diabetic 10-year-old um, or a diabetic 70-year-old? How does that differ? We bring specialists in to provide that. And then um, every quarter, we actually have two and a half, three-day on-campus sessions where you come back and get skills-based, hands-on um, experience that may expand your skills in, say, IUD insertions, endometrial biopsies, um, IND of abscesses, suturing, things that we really start uh, with a weak immersion before we even send you out on some of those basic core experiences that we know you're going to need. You learned maybe in school, but you didn't get a chance to really um, feel confident. So we're going to uh, provide that. And then we also have mentorship program where we actually match you up with a similar NP in a similar practice. Um, that can be a resource that you can call and say, hey, I just saw this patient and I just want some thoughts. I know you can't provide me medical advice, but could you give me an idea of how you might manage this type of patient? And so that um, informal uh, mentorship is really, really valuable for new grads. In the second quarter, we move you into specialty rotations. And some of those rotations, uh, we'll share with you in the next slide what those look like. We also provide a quality improvement project uh, framework on how to do quality improvement um, around um, uh, complex situations within your clinic. Um, for example, it could be patient flow. It could be uh, dashboard adherence on um, healthcare screening. Um, and so we actually facilitate your ability to understand how to use that as a clinician within the healthcare environment to improve clinic practice and patient outcomes. 
Then we also provide funding, partial funding for an educational conference. Many of our residents go to CAMP, uh, the California Association of Nurse Practitioner Conference. Um, other specialty conferences are an option if you have a, a focused area, say in wound care or in transgender care, something of that nature, then um, we can preview whether those would be good options. And then we also provide uh, multiple simulation opportunities where you actually may be a facilitator after training. So you actually enhance your skills as an educator and preceptor too, uh, that matches up in your future leadership within the nurse practitioner role. And then by the third quarter, we really move you in and match you into some opportunities poverty simulations with nursing students where you actually uh, gain that leadership. And then in the final, um, throughout, we've been doing wound care uh, specialization uh, modules that are self-paced, uh, that are nationally recognized, that you can actually sit for an exam that gives you a certification in wound care. And then at the end, we actually provide the opportunity for you to give your quality improvement presentation. Sometimes those have gone really well. Sometimes they're a challenge and they're not complete, but they always show some benefit to the clinic where you've been and to your learning process. So that in a nutshell is the 12 months that you would spend with us. So right off the bat, you mentioned this is a HRSA funded um, opportunity that brought, apart, brought together this um, partnership with federally qualified health care centers, so the FQHCs. Um, obviously, that's a special component of this program. What else makes this special, in your opinion? Well, I think the association with UC Davis, UC Davis has the largest encatchment area of any of the University of California um, universities. Uh, the UC system worldwide is the largest university in the world collectively between our nine campuses. The resources for learning, for education, for expertise, for development of the clinician role, particularly as an advanced practice nurse, is phenomenal. Um, I think it's hard to say any other organization can compete with the resources we have to access to experience in the 34 counties that we serve throughout Northern, Cali Northern and Central California. This may be from the Central Valley. You can see these are federally qualified health center uh, partners, and they are actually located throughout the Central Valley and Northern California. They range from generally the Fresno area, um, all the way up to uh, above um, Sacramento into the Sierra Nevada foothills and throughout the greater Sacramento area. Those health centers serve a very wide population of underserved, um, high risk, complex patients um, that maybe only um, may have to drive an hour to get to you because they um, are rural or they may be working in migrant labor camps. Um, they may have had uh, significant um, healthcare disparities and they're looking for someone that is caring, that is competent and wants to really improve their uh, care in a partnership. And that's what we provide is the skills to enhance the, what you bring uh, to us, which is an empathetic, caring healthcare clinician. So you get the primary care and you get the specialty care rotation. So I'm going to let you take a little sip of water. I'll bring, I'm going to bring in um, one of those um, specialty care preceptors that I, I teased at the beginning. Um, Dr. Holly Kirkland-Kine is wound care director at UC Davis Health. She has served as a specialty care preceptor for the residency program and plans to serve as a primary care preceptor for residents in this upcoming cohort. She's very supportive of the program. Um, Dr. Kirkland Kine, thank you so much for joining us. As, as we look at our community partners and then what goes on in, in, in UC Davis Health, can you kind of share with us what is the role that you provide as an NP preceptor? So as a preceptor, I have been precepting students for years, NP students, PA students on wound care. Um, looking at wound care itself, um, I, uh, a researcher and also a wound care specialist, um, looking at, re at any of the research, there is no program specific for NPs and PAs, but specific for NPs on wound care. Now, there are lots for nurses. They're very expensive, but they don't really cover your role. And as an NP, as soon as you graduate, you're expected to know what to order for people, how to diagnose people with different wounds, 
And this isn't something that's usually taught on a very in-depth process uh, for nurse practitioners. And that's why um, I'm working on having a specific program here. Uh, we're developing um, lots of videos with, with you know, working on, on different educational things, how to tell the difference between a pressure ulcer and other things, uh, differential diagnosis, how to order things from the community, what to do with people who may not have any resources. So um, anyways, that's, that's kind of my passion is wound care. And at the end of this program, you would be able to sit the, um, the boards, the national boards to become wound care certified. And it's a great skill to have no matter what area you're going to eventually work in, because every area, the patients have issues with their, their wounds. And I, I love teaching and I've been um, teaching this wound care program specifically for a while. And again, I'm always looking to advance uh, nurse practitioners in wound care. So what are your expectations of the residents throughout the 12 month program? You know, I just like them to show up and to be engaged. Um, you know, right now we're again working on some some videos uh, to be able to have continuing education units and to be able to have some asynchronous education. Um, and I'd like, you know, right now I'm using the current students where they're going to be uh, beta testers and let me know what they think about the educational part that we're sending. Men, most of them have worked as nurses, and I think a lot of times nurses think, "Oh, I know everything there is to know about wounds." But, you know, when you're responsible for it, as I say, you better know what that diagnosis is. And so, again, I just ask you to bring your curiosity and your, your passion to it. And Carrie is going to be speaking in a few minutes. And she and I have worked together um, on some, some issues around um, working with patients with wounds in a low resource setting. So, um, again, just be curious and have fun. Clearly, you're passionate about patient care. Um, why, why do you get so excited about serving as a preceptor? Because I imagine it takes a little extra time as you're walking a resident through, um, talking through a case and, and maybe shadowing you in some instances. Why do you get so excited about it? Because it's, it, I think the, the exciting part is, is that people often come to it with a certain perception that they think they know what it is and that it's easy because you know, you can decide what you're going to put on something. But I said, the, the, there's a skill to it. There's a, you know, like a, not only is it a science, but there's an art to it when you're dealing with patients with wounds, especially in the community. And it helps you to develop, well, to develop a relationship, not only with the student, but with the student, with the patient. And so there's this, and, and, I, and the community. So I do have a lot of community partners that the patients uh, or that the nurses will go to see and the patients go to see. And um, we all get to kind of know each other. It's great. I kind of imagine that the, the residents' questions probably keep you on your toes as well, right? Because <laughs> they're inquisitive. Yeah. yeah. And they come up with, with answers, you know, very creative answers sometimes. So it's okay. great. And we do a lot of stuff around quality improvement. I'm, I'm very much into the you know, quality improvement uh, process for uh, patients, both in the clinic and at home. And um, we created some videos uh, for um, patients through AARP on uh, caregiver, teaching caregivers how to look after people with wounds at home. They found the number one and two reasons that people get admitted to a nursing home is, um, you know, first one is, is, you know, sort of uncontrollable behavior, but number two are wounds and, and incontinence. So, you know, being able to teach people how to, how to deal with those things at home can really help them let people age in place at home. Pretty powerful. Yeah. And that, that's an excellent point. Well, you mentioned that Carrie Garland is here, here with us. Yeah. Carrie completed the residency program this uh, past September, um, and she had clinical experiences at a federally qualified health center. So um, she earned a Master of Science Family Nurse Practitioner degree from the Betty I. Reed Moore School of Nursing. And she worked as a reg registered nurse 12 years before getting her advanced NP degree. Uh, she continues to serve in a faculty role, mentoring and precepting NP and PA students at an FQHC. So that's a large mouthful with a lot of accomplishments. But Gary, I think the biggest question is, why did you decide to do the program? So 
I chose to do a residency program because I was nervous going out because as um, Holly was saying, you're having to make all the decisions. You're supposed to know what you're supposed to do. And I didn't have all the answers. And so I wanted that extra support um, behind this and um, being able to slowly ramp up and get used to what I was doing versus uh, a lot of people where they'll throw you in, you get two weeks of like a slighter, less load, and then all of a sudden you're expected to have a full load and have all the answers. So the confidence boost is what drove you to the program. What additionally did you get out of the 12 months? It, you know, in addition to building your confidence and, and, and how you now interact with patients, there had to be more. Yeah, so there's a lot that was helpful with this program. Um, so going in, I really enjoyed the way that um, the program was able to tailor our needs. Um, it's a small group. My cohort was 10 people. And so at the beginning, we were able to say like, hey, because we all graduated during the pandemic. And so there was limited opportunities with teaching and experiences going through school. So we were able to put down a list of like, these are things that we really feel like we need more education with. Um, and so they tried to tailor some of our specific um, class experiences, um, in-person experiences and stuff to those needs that we had identified, as well as the fact that um, getting like throughout the program as it's like, hey, I've been running into this a lot, you know, and like one of them was like smoking cessation for me because I was like, all my people smoke, you know, and I never had a lot of education about like what's an effective way of helping people quit smoking, you know, and so then we we're able to get some information about that, even like, you know, partway through the program and stuff. So it was really great to have these experiences that as you go through and you run into roadblocks, or you run into things, you're like, hey, here's a little bit extra information about how to address this. Um, it was also great being able to have that ramp up period where I wasn't expected to see a full panel of patients because even just like the first time you're like, oh my gosh, I'm treating just strep throat, you know, do I have the right, you know, antibiotics, do I have everything right, you know? And so being able to have that confidence to look things up, have the time to spend, you know, having these thorough interviews with patients and stuff like that when you're doing your initial um, assessments and things like that really gives you the confidence to then be like later on, oh, I nailed it. These are, you know, my nailing down kind of like my key core questions. How do I want to treat this and approach this? So we outlined some of the unique aspects of our program, but NP residency programs are not unique. I mean, there are, there are several. What was it about the one here at UC Davis Health that um, resonated with you, that you would you know, recommend it to um, the folks who are joining us today? I do have to admit, I live in the area, so I was going for not having to move. Um, but having graduated from UC Davis, I knew that there were quality faculty there who were very supportive in wanting the students to do um, a good job. Um, the school itself, UC Davis, has a lot of resources available to students, um, like being able to have access for free, up-to-date visual diagnosis, like other things like that, the library. Um, there's just a lot of resources that just UC Davis in general brings. Um, I also appreciated with UC Davis that has a lot of partnerships in the area. So I knew that there would be a lot of experiences um, for being able to do other things outside of just the primary care aspect, as well as um, when they have the guest lectures, there's the School of Nursing, but there's also a very close tie with the School of Medicine. So we were able to get experts in their fields to come in and actually discuss these things with us, which was a really good experience as well. Oh, and the simulation, because you have good facilities there. So it was nice to be able to have that um, access to simulation as well as standardized patients. So you had exposure to all of that con new knowledge constantly coming in and you were refining those skills. How, what other aspects of the program now do you put into practice daily with, when you're with patients? Maybe some of that, um, that higher level thinking you learned or something you might have learned from mentoring? Yeah, so um, putting things into practice, I think a lot of it is just getting that confidence because when you step out and you're having to be like oh i am making all the decisions now because that was one of the things that was unique about the residency program is like i came in i do have a preceptor working with me you know and so if i had questions i would go up to them and be like hey this is what i'm thinking what would you do but then in the end they're like you know this is what i would do but you're now the provider 
you make the decisions, you know, and it's going to be your patient you're seeing, your panel you're seeing. And so at the end, it's your choice of what you want to do. Um, and so that was just like a really like, oh my goodness, feeling in the beginning, um, but being able to step out and be like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And having that confidence, you know, when I finished the program, I started a new job and it was the, you get two weeks to kind of like ramp up and now you're on your own. And so having that confidence behind myself to be like, okay, yes, I can be a nurse practitioner. Am I perfect? No. But do I feel like I have a basis to grow from working with people doing, you know, having at least some better time management than what I did in school is definitely there. Thank you for sharing your perspective. Um, and thank you all who are uh, putting in questions. Some great questions are coming in. I look forward to getting that um, in a moment. But first, I want to bring in that one of those brave uh, alumna of the program who came into the very first cohort, who I got to visit with during those pandemic days when we were like, really? Really? This is how we're doing this? Um, Dr. Jessamine Phillips uh, is joining us. Uh, Jessamine earned a Doctor of Nursing Practice, Family Nurse Practitioner degree from the University of San Francisco in 2019. Before that, she worked as a registered nurse for nine years. Um, and then after completing the NP residency program, she took a permanent position with One Community Health, where um, she served as a resident. Um, so, Jessamine, it's great to see you again. Uh, and, and thank you for... Um, carving out some time for us. Um, walk me through how you transitioned from that residency experience and mindset into becoming a, you know, the provider now, um, with now with a couple of years under your belt. Well, I actually transitioned. I just took a week off from the residency and then started here at One Community. And I did that purposefully because um, I wanted to get started and I wanted to keep my panel. Um, and I was able to step into practice with an additional year of training under my belt. And my transition was actually much smoother than another provider that started that had had a year of experience as a new grad at another FQHC and then onboarded the same week that I did. Um, so I was really able to recognize, hey, I got a, a really valuable experience. I got extra experience with procedures that you don't necessarily get exposed to during school. Um, I was comfortable with Nexplanon removals um, and then pelvic exams, right? You just, you, you need to do 10 of them and then you're like, okay, I, I got this. I'm comfortable with this. Um, but then also I was much more comfortable with not knowing, okay? When you're in the MP role, many of us uh, have had a lot of experience as bedside nurses and we've got that down, we are competent, but then the role changes. And when you are responsible for everything, you recognize, oh, even the, it doesn't necessarily work out as X, Y, and Z. You have a patient come in with a set of symptoms. You have a set of differentials that you have to work at. You have to work up to know, okay, this is what they have. Um, whereas my colleague didn't have that. And I actually ended up being um, kind of a resource to her in um, my one community health environment. So what would your advice be to, to someone who's considering an NP residency um, and considering this program, how can they make that 12 months the best 12 months and really take advantage of all the opportunities possible? So uh, my first suggestion is to have a toolbox ready when you step into practice. Be aware of what are the 40 most common diagnoses that you see in primary care. So I'll give you a hint, hypertension, diabetes, um, contraceptive choices, okay? And then have ready, this is your go-to, these are the guidelines that are recommended, these are what we follow. And then that way, when you're unsure of yourself or you're getting flustered, you're able to grab onto that and feel confident with knowing this is what we do, okay? Um, having templates, so that during your onboarding, you should be 
working usually an EHR of some kind, you can connect with IT and just having a template for this is an urgent care visit. This is a patient following up on diabetes. This is a patient here for chronic care management. So that when you have your templates in place, it makes documentation um, smoother. And it also helps you because so much of it is management of practice, right? And getting your flow and your routine down of, of seeing patients. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I would recommend is knowing your resources. So up to date is your friend. You're going to have to get comfortable with looking things up. Good advice. Don't go anywhere because some of these questions you may be able to speak to um, in addition to, to Carrie and, and Holly's insight as well. Um, we're about to get to the questions, but before we do, Laura, let me bring you back in. Can you just walk us through what the application process looks like? Sure. Well, obviously, um, you need to be able to graduate from your nurse practitioner program. And I think we have a slide on that. Um, and so we need to have you graduate between April 2nd, 22 and June 15th of 2023. Um, I did see someone have a question that their uh, DMP was actually a date later than their, um, their graduation from their program. That's not uncommon that we've seen in some residents, but it is something, it's individual that we have to have some dialogue around. Um, the other thing is that's really important that you submit the online um, application with the very specific documents that are included here, your CV, your contact information, the two references, uh, which are not written references, but are actually names that you will provide contact information. And then we will be in touch with them with a specific um, tool um, to have them full, fill out um, to give you um, a, a endorsement and feedback um, to us. Um, there is a personal statement. And the comment I want to make about the personal statement is um, this is not a student program. You are a full fully qualified, graduated uh, clinician. And so we want to hear how your experiences, your life experiences, your nursing experiences, your student experiences have enriched you or been challenging, but we want to hear about who you are and how you're going to bring all that forward as a fully um, certified clinician. So be real with us, be real about yourself. Um, and if you've had challenges um, that were made life tough at one point, share that because your resilience is what we're looking for. Um, then of course, we need your transcripts that prove um, that you graduated with a, a credentialed program. And then um, you need to make a statement of contributions to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that doesn't mean just you as a person uh, of, of uh, diversity or color. Um, it is about your experiences and engagement with people who might look different than you, who might come from a different background from you, and your attitudes and experiences that will allow you to be a empathetic caring, informed um, individual as a clinician serving um, a diverse population. Our clients are very diverse uh, within our FQHCs. It's really important to review the checklist and be really uh, strategic about your plan. Don't miss, miss that deadline. And the applications are due February 13th. Um, we do have a, a Q&A coming up. Um, and then the program actually starts October 2nd. And I did see a question about whether um, you, you have to move. And um, I, I will uh, address that a little bit more when we talk about some criteria, um, expectations of the program. But in general, um, we do not have a, a program specifically in the Bay Area. Um, so commuting from the Bay Area typically would not be a realistic um, situation unless you had family that you were staying with. It is a, a, a full-time program um, within the Central and Northern California area. But once you get this application, as thorough as it is, you're still not done. <laughs> what comes next after the application part? Yeah. So, um, you know, you have to have national board certification that is a requirement to bill for Medicare um, and uh, generally to practice within our FQHCs. Um, you have to have um, the uh, nurse practitioner furnishing letter uh, um, number from the California Board of um, uh, Nursing, also the NP certification from the BRN. 
and then also an RN license from California BRM. Those are all achievable from out-of-state people, but it takes a little extra time. So you have to be very much on top of things if you're an out-of-state individual. Um, sometimes there's been some delays on the BRN end after people graduate. We understand that, but we have to know that you're good to go uh, when the program starts. The other thing is we may have some additional requirements. Uh, you need a DEA license uh, to be a prescriber in FQHCs, um, so you need to understand that. That needs to be associated usually with a clinic um, address, and so we can assist you with that uh, once you've accepted an offer. And then, of course, you need to have basic life support. Um, you'll be applying for an MPI. We can help you with all of those types of new clinician practice issues. Um, due dates vary uh, based on what item is uh, required. So please, please just stay on top of it. Um, some of the special reminders, this absolutely is a Monday through Friday program. I will say that later in practice, because you're an employee, you are not a student, you're an employee of ours, uh, of, of UC Davis, but also of the, the clinics where you practice. There are some um, on-call um, opportunities that we think is a positive part of developing your skills within a mentoring environment. And so there have been some op rare occasional opportunities where um, our residents have participated in some weekend call, uh, again, with a very special uh, focused uh, backup. And again, it's another skill opportunity. So in general, we say Monday through uh, Friday, that does not exclude what your clinic might request um, later within that. Also, keep in mind that there's very specific dates about when you must pass national boards. Um, some people struggle to pass the first time. Um, that's okay. You know, that, that's, that's a road bump. It's not an exclusion. We're not counting up how many times it takes to pass. Um, but we do want you to take your best shot. And you do, if for those graduating before, for January 31st, um, we need you to have passed boards by February 28th, June 15th for out-of-state applications uh, that graduate after January 31st. And again, that's because we know how long it takes to get through the BRN and then July 22nd for in-state for those that have graduated after January 31st. Um, so again, um, be aware of what it takes to get your national certification. We don't care whether it's the AANP or ANCC. Um, and, and again, if you're in especially like PNP, psych mental health, those certifications um, are appropriate to your scope of practice. That's what we're looking for. And I will speak to that a little bit more. The other thing I wanna speak to just very quickly, um, we have noticed some pandemic uh, type of effects um, in the learning and the hands-on opportunities that some individuals have experienced through their education over the last couple of years. And we felt um, the need to support uh, with a little extra um, hands-on sometimes. Um, be aware that you need to have the skill to do a head-to-toe physical uh, with some degree of fluidity and confidence including specialty exams around neuro exam, uh, psych mental health, uh, basic assessment, mental health. Um, those specialty uh, mini exams, um, the ability to do a focused exam in respiratory or uh, muscular skeletal will enhance those skills, but you need to have a core if you don't feel confident in those areas, we want you to do some self um, you know, study so that you walk in ready to uh, be open to how we advance your skills as a practicing clinician. You know, we do have a question. You bring up the psych mental health. Is this program mainly for FMPs um, rather than a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner focus, which we do not have a special residency for PM h &P, but um, how would someone with that specialty fare in a residency like this? Well, one of the things, this is actually new this year that we're looking at that opportunity because of the need. And so some of our FQHCs actually are looking for clinicians in those areas. We know there's a shortage in that area. Uh, we know there's shortage in, in um, women's health. And so we're opening this up. Um, we are looking at those opportunities within our partners, FQHC partners. And um, so 
that being said, you still need the really good core skills that come in with, um, you know, general assessment that come with being a nurse practitioner, and then the enhanced psych mental health and peace skill set as well. So it's new this year that we're adding that as a focus. Um, and so our details around that we're still working on a little bit, uh, but don't be afraid to apply. If there's one thing I can say about this program, and I think Carrie had mentioned that, we are highly adapted to the needs of our residents, and we have a depth of faculty experience and clinicians to support the types of specialty interest and skill needs and scope of practice for the residents that we um, accept in the program. Excellent. Now, you did mention that these are not students. Um, our residents are practicing uh, providers, which earn a salary. So we do have a couple of questions on our website. You know, we say that, um, uh, you know, salaries will be announced at a later date. Do we have the salary yet for the 2023 cohort coming in? No, we do not have that yet. And again, that's based on funding issues that are beyond um, our abilities. Um, that would be something that would be um, clear prior to you being required to accept, uh, certainly. But at this time, we can't um, declare what those salaries are because they're in negotiation with our funding agencies too. Um, we also, with our partners, um, have a shared cost. And again, uh, so those are still uh, not posted, but they will be at the time of offerings. Good to know. Um, what are the benefits that, in addition with the salary benefits, vacation time, sick time, weekend, holiday, does it depend on the residency or does it depend on the clinic? You know, because you're actually an employee of UC Davis, then you do have um, certain uh, quote unquote faculty types of um, uh, benefits. That being said, FQHCs have to function, you know, um, throughout the year. And so because you're an employee and you are technically low man on the totem pole, this is the reality of entering as a new clinician then we expect um, negotiation within your clinic about who may be covering on certain days during certain holidays. And so there is no one particular policy. If you're expected to work on what is a UC Davis holiday, then we would um, expect that you have a different day off possibly. So it becomes this real uh, partnership, um, like a real clinician, uh, which you are in your clinic, of coverage for the clinic, um, and flexibility, which is critical to this role. And then uh, you may be taking your holiday on a day other than. We ask that you not be asking for um, holiday or vacation time within your first um, three to six months. Um, we know you're walking in on holiday time early on, but again, clinics have to cover clinic care. And that is this role uh, for your career. And these are... Monday to Friday working hour clinics, in addition to the on-call you mentioned, no evening shifts as if you were back in acute care um, as an RN, correct? No, no. no. Um, I will say um, if one of our partners said, okay, we think it's important to offer an evening clinic, um, as any employee would be included in that discussion, then we would also include you. We don't have any of those at this point in time, but that being said, um, that is the kind of thing that is a part of the career of the future, is increasing access in a variety of ways, and extended hours is one of those things. Yeah, telehealth has taught us a lot during the, the pandemic. Um, yeah. Jessamyn, we have a question for you. Um, did you have a chance to have your own patients on your own schedule, or did you and your preceptor share a schedule and split the patients? No, the, I had my own panel. They were all my own patients. Excellent. Um, the okay. Here's one on the DEA, DEI statement guidelines. Um, on the website, um, they're geared toward academic faculty. But are there any additional guidelines that that any of our panel would have here for writing the statement, given the given the clinical focus of this residency? I'm trying to understand that question again. You're muted. How can one best speak to diversity, equity, and inclusion with a <laughs> clinical focus? Um, because that is the largest nature of this residency is actually you know clinical time versus academic. 
You know, I'll speak to that quickly because um, I was a clinician before I became an academic. And so um, this is a uh, technically an academic role because you're being hired as a clinical instructor through UC Davis. So you do have to meet some of those requirements around that DEI statement. And so it is filtered in that type of way. And you can actually go online and look up examples of DEI statements um, that are put out through the UC system, for example. But I will share when I walked in uh, as a clinician entering the academic environment, I spoke to the fact that, you know, I had worked in uh, public health, um, that I had volunteered uh, doing flying doctors, um, that I had worked in uh, low resource environments, and that I had taken seminars specifically on how to provide uh, skills um, and uh, procedures for um, um, under accessed populations, uh, special needs. So I went into women's health as a subspecialist uh, because it was not a resource available in my rural community. So speak to how you apply your skills, your experiences, um, and how you will meet our mission and vision of serving underserved um, diverse uh, populations. So there's no one formula. Um, I do want to make one other comment too about references that I didn't address as well as I would like. We are looking for your references to people who know you as a clinician. Uh, that can be a preceptor that you had, preferably someone you spent 160 hours with. Um, we, we know you probably have some good resources related to uh, your RN years, and that's not wrong but they can't speak maybe to your uh, NP uh, clinician skills, but they maybe could be very strong speaking to the fact that you worked in um, trauma ICU, you know, uh, for five years and that they were impressed with your clinical decision-making, your confidence and your ability to stay calm within that high uh, stakes environment. That would be very valuable, even though it is not you as an NP. So look to two people who can speak to those types of skills and abilities. Yeah, we often say a parent or a partner are not the recommenders that we're looking for. <laughs> not, your, not your neighbor, even if it's a doctor. We don't want to hear about how they watched you grow up. We want some <laughs> hardcore assessment of you um, within your clinical decision making, uh, your ability to work with patients, um, and even your uh, empathy and, and support in, in uh, low resource and diverse Okay. Okay. Um, oh. I don't know if we just lost lost Laura. Um, Carrie, let me bring you in and, and kind of talk to me how you got your clinic site assess, uh, assignments. Um, how did that work? Did you pick? Did you have to drive? Um, and, and how did that work for you? So yeah, so um, the, the program itself assigns you to your clinic site. Um, so they try to find sites kind of where you live. We had some people in my cohort who lived in the Fresno area. Um, so they had a site that, that was down there, um, but it's kind of like all over the place. So it depends. So some people did have to kind of relocate a little bit to do their assignments and do their sites. Um, for the specialty rotations, they also helped assign that for us as well uh, to let us know where we're going for that. Excellent. Um, so uh, Laura's back. Laura, is relocating to the Sacramento area encouraged? Well, one of the things that is important is that you, um, just like any employee, um, has to have a responsible uh, access to where they work. Um, it is not realistic uh, to have long commutes. I won't define what that is, but we generally think you should be, um, for example, I'm, I'm an hour away, you know, uh, from UC Davis, you know, and, and where I teach. Um, but as a clinician, you, you need to have stable housing. And so if you are not living in proximity to the, the uh, FQHC or a clinic um, where you are placed, uh, we do expect stable, that is relocation for some people, um, that plays into people's decisions about accepting an offer. We try to match people's interests and requests, but we cannot guarantee that. 
a whole variety of things go into matches. Um, I see also someone asking about a women's health nurse practitioner. Um, we are working out right now with some of our FQHCs about whether they have a five day a week, you know, women's health MP setting. And so I would say um, apply. Um, and we are in the process of nailing down those types of opportunities. Uh, that being said, even in women's health, um, you still um, could be doing a contraceptive uh, clinic in a family practice uh, day as a half day clinic, for example, in that same FQHC, even though it's not a dedicated women's health for that day. So we are growing and trying to meet those advanced needs uh, of our clinics and our uh, client population by expanding to the MPs that we want to support in this residency program. So I would say apply, and then um, we are sorting that out and trying to enhance the opportunities for that type of residency. It's new to have those specialty uh, residencies, and we are progressive, which is why we, we will many times say, hang in there, we're working this out. And by and large, we do a pretty good job of it, but we're all about change, progression, and moving forward to meet uh, population needs. Are there opportunities for uh, a pediatric primary care nurse practitioner in the program? Very similar to the psych mental health um, and the women's health. Uh, this is new this year that we are providing these um, opportunities. We are still working out the details of exactly which clinics have those dedicated hours. And uh, we wouldn't expect you to travel all over. I will also say for those that are placed, say in Fresno um, or live around that Central Valley area or up in the Sierra foothills, that we, uh, when we have our on-site training skills uh, in, in immersions, we actually bring you in and put you in um, at a, a hotel um, on campus here so that you're not commuting during those immersion days. So we do um, pay attention to the commute time. Um, uh, we've had some situations where people did not relocate to the stable housing. And I can't say that works well uh, for residents any more than it does for a new uh, employee uh, trying to be successful at um, a new job. And are you at the same site the entire 12 months or do you rotate the FQHC where you're placed? There's a continuity the there, correct? Yes, yes, because we ramp you up slow. This, this came up too. We expect you to do a patient an hour, roughly, you know, six a day. Uh, before we ramp you up to 20 a day at the end. So there is a progression there that is highly beneficial in a residency program that you do not get as a new grad. That relationship with that preceptor and more than one preceptor within your clinic frequently is important. And so we start by ramping you out. Uh, we expect you to be able to walk in and take a history and do a basic physical from day one within the supervision of a preceptor. We allow some shadowing, but this is not shadowing. You're a licensed clinician. Um, so we do support you in this ramp up and we have agreements with the clinics, what that ramp up looks like. And uh, in information sessions, we can share that with you. It's very generous. Probably one of the things we've heard from our residents is they're sure glad they're in residency because they talk to their former classmates and hear what they're doing of the expectations. And they're very happy to be in a ramp up program. Okay, great. So you answer one of those questions. You start with 10, you ramp up till about 20 patients a day. So that was, yeah, someone was curious start about with, that. Start with like six. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, it's six. There you go. Um, so in general, how many applicants are, are, are applying to our, our program each year and, and how many do we um, will we be accepting for this next cohort? Well, this is another um, thing that's in flux um, because we are um, in limbo on some funding. Um, we are not totally clear ourselves the exact number that we are gonna be able to accept. We have had 10 for the last three years. Um, our funding is, is changing a little bit. Um, the program is absolutely here and it's not going away. Um, and so we're actually waiting for some grant uh, messaging. We know we've secured some other funding. Our FQHCs are all on board. In fact, we have new ones clamoring to say we wanna be a part of your program too. So we don't know the exact number um, of, of offers that we're gonna be able to make. And um, so that will be certainly clear by the time we make those offers. We'll say we have this number that are funded and we will not offer and then say, sorry, we don't have funding for you. We know you're making life changes. Um, I also saw someone was saying they're in, uh, living in Southern California. Um, 
We do not have relocation funds for this particular program. Um, that happens at high level faculty <laughs> uh, physicians. It is not the norm uh, for this. Um, so I, I would say, no, uh, that's not. Do we help though? Uh, does the university have relocation resources uh, for uh, suggesting neighborhoods and advice? Yes, and all of us faculty throughout the area would provide that type of um, support as well. We want you to be successful in where you move and also um, where, where you're placed in the clinic. We're about success. Excellent. Uh, we're getting close to the top of the hour, um, and there are a few questions that are still there. Um, our incredible team, um, our staff who runs this program and manages this program alongside Laura, will be answering these questions. We'll follow up with you via email. One of the things I wanted to make sure, um, there's our email, um, and I want to hear from both Jessamine and Carrie briefly about what is the experience like with your cohort mates? Um, as we mapped out the program and you see when you come, or what day you have campus days, but you're in your FQHC a good bit of the time. Um, Carrie, can you speak to um, the, the friendships uh, that, that you've developed in your cohort? Oh yeah, I mean, it was, it was really great. My cohort was really tight knit. Um, we had like a general text with all of us, like a group text. And so uh, there are many times where people are like, hey, I'm running into this problem. We would text it to the group text and then you would have people, you know, writing back of like, oh, this is what I did in that situation or, oh, this is the resource that I have for that. And then um, we would um, hang out even. We would get drinks or something after because when we'd have the three days where we were there in person, um, it'd be like, hey, does anyone want to go out for dinner or something afterwards? So it's great. We're still keeping in touch now. Um, we had a good knit cohort. Jessamine, still some BFFs from that cohort? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a joke that we have. But yes, I've met my best friend in the residency and Sarah and I are still um, very, very close. So um, you'll have a group text with, you know, all of uh, the other members in the cohort. Um, and then you'll get, we did once a month, we would go on, we did wine tasting because a lot of people weren't from the area. So um, you're going to love it. You're going to make fantastic friendships. Good. I wanted to make sure that, that, that all of you participating in today's webinar really understood that um, it is a student-like experience in that in set, um, or uh, these are your colleagues, um, but there is a close-knit uh, bond that develops over the 12 months. Um, Laura, your last plug uh, before we go um, for why people need to apply? Well, I just think being a nurse practitioner is the best job in the world. And why not do it to the best of your abilities with the kind of support that you can get in a program like this? Um, I'm so proud uh, to have Carrie and Jasmine right in front of you here. Um, you've got people who are best of the best. They were the best of the best when they came in, but they came out even better, I think. And I'm proud to call them my colleagues um, and, and practicing within the community. And so I would say jump with both feet. Um, you know, we want you to be happy. The one thing I will say is if this is not a good time in your life for an intense program, then I would take a hard look at that. But being a new clinician is an intense experience. I think you get support here um, that is strong, um, but this is not a cakewalk. Um, NP school was hard this year is hard too. It is extending your educational um, learning. Um, we expect you to be um, self-starter, self-motivated, and a lifelong learner um, in that asynchronous experience as well. We don't hold your hand in the sense of saying you're a student. It is not on us to teach you basics, but we will nurture you in every way possible. And that includes, you get my cell number. If you need someone, you know, just get through your day, text me. And there's lots of nodding going on. So that, <laughs> that is a, that's a great um, a part to end on. Um, I do encourage you also, we did throw a lot of dates and, and very specific details in the application out. It is all on the website. We will follow up with this copy of the webinar recording tomorrow via email. Once again, you can refer to that. We have an incredible 
team that is here to answer any questions you have. So feel free to use our email address. And we work really hard um, to make these webinars um, meaningful uh, and, and giving you the information that you need. So you'll get a quick survey when we complete. If you could please fill it out, it just helps us do better. Um, and, um, and that's what we wanna be here for you. Uh, we wish you the best of luck as you do map out your future, um, whether it's with our residency program, another residency program, or just going straight into your practice. Um, we thank you so much for joining us today. And for everyone here at the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing, I'm Rebecca Badeau. Be well. <laughs>